We are very fortunate to have Dr. Ronal Serpas uh, in town today. He flew up last night from New Orleans to serve as our keynote speaker. Dr. Serpas is a professor of criminology and justice at Loyola University in New Orleans. He recently retired from a 34-year career in active law enforcement. Over the final 13 years of Dr. Serpas's career, he served as the police superintendent of New Orleans, the police chief of Nashville, and the chief of the Washington State Police. In each of those departments, Dr. Serpas realized a significant decrease in, in crime and an increase in the satisfaction with the police departments. And so what more can we ask than that? Uh, he served as the second vice president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. He's currently the chair of the International Association of Chiefs of Police Community Policing Committee. He's the chairman of the Law Enforcement Leaders to Reduce Crime and Incarceration, and he's a member of the National Advisory Board to Cure Violence. Dr. Serpas is well published in various law enforcement topics, including firearm violence in America. He's often called upon by national television, radio, and print outlets to offer his expert commentary on crime rates, policing, criminal justice reform, and the like. Um, I had a chance to have dinner with him last night, and he is uh, just as remarkable and in, as engaging as advertised. Um, I said to Dr. Serpis this morning, how long do you need to speak? And his answer was, I can speak as long as you want. Just let me know. And so he's got a wealth of information. What we're going to do is ask him to, um, to share some thoughts with you for a while. And then um, somebody came up with the brilliant idea of getting a wireless microphone. So hopefully we'll have questions from our audience that can be asked to Dr. Serpis, and you don't have to use those note cards anymore. We can hand you the microphone and you can ask the question directly to him. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ronald Serpis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I wanted to first and foremost thank Dan, Terry, and Lori for helping to bring us together here today. And I especially want to call out Catherine, who gave me the most brilliant way to make these PowerPoints pleasing and entertaining, but I just found out. So you're going to have to put up with the one I got. I'm sorry. <laughs> Secondly, let me first apologize. Yep, I'm from New Orleans. You're not going to be able to understand half of what I say. So let me give you a first few clues. If I say your mom and them, that means your family. Everybody in here so far today has used the word y'all. You know there's a plural to y'all, all y'all. <laughs> so these are the kind of things you're going to have to learn to work with. Um, when you look at what I've been able to do in my life and career, it's obvious that I could not keep a job. And over the uh, 13 years I was a chief executive, I had a chance to learn a lot about American policing. I had a chance to learn a lot about the politics of American policing. And I had a chance to learn a lot about the depth of what communities can do the depth of what communities can do to make themselves safe. In the history of American law enforcement, we have never been in the law enforcement field the ultimate purveyors of safety. Policing has always been and was always intended to be an extension of the safety the community brought upon to itself. So when we listen to members of the clergy and we listen to these wonderful conversations earlier about preaching even though nobody's there for hope that somebody will hear, so American policing has been given um, a few good hands, if you will, but American policing has been given some bad hands, and American policing has made some bad choices. We've made good choices, but we've made bad choices. I was always a, a change agent. That's what I got hired to do. Right? Governor Locke did not say, hey, come to Washington State because everything's good. Mayor Bill Purcell, who is the best, most effective, efficient politician I've ever known in my life, did not say come to Nashville because everything is honky-dory and skippy-doo. And Mitch Landrew didn't say return home to New Orleans because things were good. So we've had to make the tough calls. We arrested nearly 90 police officers when I was chief in New Orleans, disciplined thousands of more over my career. But at the end of the day, what we really learned over all these years is that American policing has every opportunity to be successful. And we have to hold American policing to a higher standard for an important, important reason. Should lawyers hold themselves to a standard? Of course. Should doctors, nurses? Of course. But the difference that we try to impress into the minds of these young police officers is simply 
the Walmart story. You live in Chicago. I live in New Orleans. If I want to go to the Walmart on the West Bank, I can choose to go to that Walmart. If I want to go to the Walmart on the East Bank, I can choose to go to that Walmart. If I don't like my lawyer, I can go find another one. There's only 10,000 in a phone book, right? I can go find me another one. If I don't like my doctor, I can go find me another one. But I don't get to pick which cop pulls me over. I don't get to pick which cop comes investigate the crime committed against me. I don't get to pick which cop is going to arrest me or my family member. So police literally, in a way, can never lose sight of the fact that they have to raise themselves above the standard expectations of ethical behavior. Now, this is a commercial. I hate to do this, but I have a national role with law enforcement leaders to reduce crime, and I have to do this. This is where my first picture would have been. Imagine instead of the words, Joe Montana on the left and Tom Brady on the right, right? Everybody in here knows who Joe Montana was? Greatest quarterback of the 1970s and early 80s. Four-time Super Bowl winner. We all know who Tom Brady is. Greatest quarterback of this generation, five-time Super Bowl winner. The reason I want to keep crime in a national his historic perspective is because today we have a head coach who wants to hire Joe Montana to play Tom Brady's offense. We can't do that and be successful. So we have, to, we have to always recognize, even though we know Chicago is struggling with a violent problem of young people killing each other, we have to recognize that the message that's got to go nationally is, wait, we are not in a crisis as a nation. We don't need to knee-jerk response to whether or not to go back to a Joe Montana kind of offense. A Joe Montana offense believed in a lot of arrests. I shouldn't keep saying Joe. I mean, that offensive strategy believed in a lot of arrest. That offensive strategy believed in a lot of incarceration. That offensive strategy believed in, hey, we the police, this is just the way it is because we're making you feel better. The offense that we've learned from is different. So in the last 30 years, we can't lose sight of the fact that crime's down by about half in this country. Where we are today is about half of what it was in 1991. I walked a beat on Bourbon Street in 1980 at 20 years old. I was a damn good looking kid too, let me tell you. 100 pounds less than you see right here. I was beautiful. But in the 1980s, we as a nation were overwhelmed like in one day with a wave of violent crime that followed a lot of sources. Many people jump immediately to the crack cocaine thing. Certainly it had something to do with it do with it, but there were other things too. So in the 80s and 90s, we as a nation believed in that offensive strategy. We believed if we arrest everything, if we stop everything, if we put a lot of people in jail, we'll make ourselves safer. And we can't ignore, not like we can't ignore the tip of the spear of racism through following government's laws to discriminate against people today that we know is obnoxious, we can't lose sight of the fact that, believe me, I was a young chief back then. And if you went into a room full of people like this and you said arrests were up and crime was down, it was over. You were like the best thing that ever happened. Thank goodness you're the chief. So crime has come down, and we've learned a lot from that. So in 2015 and 2016, we saw little changes, but crime primarily continues to come down. Violent crime takes the same pattern. You'll see it'll go up for a little while. It'll come down for a little while. It'll go up for a little while. Professor Propochristos, who's the smartest man in the universe, is the kind of PhD that knows math. I don't, right? They asked me to teach stats. I said, you'd have to give the students a refund. I can't do it. But we do know that unless it's a long line, these variations are going to occur. And then occasionally you will have an outlier, like unfortunately we're here to talk about today. But overall, the United States of America, and this is, by the way, by either measure. You can either look at the Uniform Crime Report, which is full of flaws, but it's old and it's been around or you can look at the National Crime Victimization Survey. We still see crime going down in America. We should be learning from that. We shouldn't be running backwards. We also know that murder, we're seeing many cities in the country, and there are a lot of cities in the country that are seeing changes in murder. I was a police chief when murder was the lowest it ever was in Nashville. That was a good year to be police chief. But how many of you math folk know that if you had 10 and you had 20, it becomes a 100% increase? 
Well, that's a little bit about what's going on with murder. Every single murder is the worst thing that could happen to a community and to a family. But across the nation, the swing is not as big as it sounds, so we should remember as a public a service announcement to whoever may be listening, we should not return to an offensive strategy from the 1980s and 90s that we now know, for a bunch of reasons we're gonna talk about, is not the way to deal with this current swing in murders in whatever city it may be going in. We have to recognize we've learned and we've evolved. So what is law enforcement leaders to reduce crime and incarceration? In October of 2015, we launched. I was the co-founding chair. This is nearly 200 police chiefs and prosecutors, federal, state, and local, in the United States who are either active or retired. Pretty conservative group, right? We're housed in the Brennan Center. Not a very conservative group. Because the duality of our message is the same on incarceration. Whether you see the imperative to reduce incarceration as a social issue, or whether you see it as a financial issue, it has to be solved. In fact, nearly 30 states have already enacted meaningful, rational changes in criminal justice systems and in sentencing because of what we've learned in the last 30 years. Louisiana, my home state, looks like it might actually add itself onto that list. Just a little fun fact, this is what you want to say at the bar later tonight, I heard Surpass say this, this is great stuff. United States, come on, you gotta, this is gonna be a long day. <laughs> The United States has 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prisoners. Louisiana is the worst of the US. So the chances of Louisiana <laughs> making meaningful change in sentencing is a positive sign. The problem is, is that the federal government is stuck in a place where last year we came really close. And the federal government is following the states on this issue. I can't do the math. What do you need to have a constitutional amendment? out of 50 states. 30 of them on their own have changed sentencing. In policing, we call that a clue. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. And these states are led by governors who are Democrats or Republicans. They're led by houses of representatives and state senates that are Democrats and Republicans. And they have all come to the recognition, recognition rec that's another New Orleans word. <laughs> They've all come to recognize that arresting everybody and incarcerating everybody is not the right answer. So we know from having a front row seat, the group that I'm lucky enough to be the chairperson of, we have every size city in America, Bill Bratton in New York, Charlie Beck in Los Angeles, myself, Nashville, you name the city, all the way to Mayberry RFD. We were the police chiefs and prosecutors on the front line in the Comstat era, in the community policing era, in the intelligence-led policing era, in the false identification era. We were the police chiefs and prosecutors. And what we said to the Clinton administration and the Trump administration, candidly, neither one of them paid much attention, by the way, we said, we just want to give you some insights, right? If you were going to bring an expert witness into court, we might be somebody you'd bring. And the message we have is that you can reduce crime and you can induce, reduce incarceration and we shouldn't let spikes in murders in a city or spikes of violent crime in cities distract us from the fundamental truth is that you can reduce them both. And in fact, we have to. Since 2008 when America went broke, something else happened that many of you who are in government know you remember what it was that really caused cities to stop hiring cops? In 2008, the rules of accounting for a city's long-term debt for pension and health care changed overnight. That meant that cities could no longer go kind of like pay as you go. When that happened in cities across America, Nashville, we had a huge retirement spurge. We, we bought a lot of retirements because we had to cut down our debt. So cities in America have not recovered from that and or have recovered from the recession, and or will probably never have as many cops as we had before. Let's just, y'all can say it with me. We ain't never gonna have as many cops as we had before. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> We're not gonna have as many prosecutors as we used to have. We're not gonna have as many prison beds as we used to have, because the realignment is now set in stone almost, if you will. So by reducing incarceration, where do we have to target? The people who should have never been incarcerated in the first place. The people who are suffering from a mental health illness. 
the people who are suffering from drug or alcohol addiction primarily driven by a mental health illness. The people who, not because of a desire, but because of a decision to not pay fines and fees, right? Judges ought to be let to make those choices instead of legislature. So we sent a letter to President Trump in February of this year. Our group's got five pretty simple ideas. Five simple ideas. They work in 30 states so far, 29 states. We hope they work in the government. One, prioritize violent, fighting violent crime. Well, of course, right? I'm not a student of the Bible, but I do know the Bible references something about a note from the big guy saying, y'all got to stop killing each other. You got to stop stealing. So we know from the oldest book in the world that there has always been some set of a population that has decided to do the bad things. And to run from that would be just as unreal as to run that everybody's bad. So we do have to focus on violent crime. I lived in New Orleans twice in my life. One time when I was in New Orleans as the chief operating officer, we cut murder in half. The second time I went to New Orleans, we cut murder to a 30-year low. It wasn't because of the police. Perhaps we had a role to play. But if the police could surely stop every murder, how many would we have? Of course, right? So the point is, we have to keep focus on violent crime. Professor Papakristos, who I'll refer to many times, has actually changed my view of American policing when I was a chief with the work he's doing on social network because how many people live in Chicago? Three million? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> how many of y'all live in Chicago? <laughs> So 2.7 million people live in Chicago, and I know for a fact from the work that Papa Cristo has done in New Orleans and other cities that there are not 2.7 million bad people in Chicago. His work is helping us be smarter with that limited resource. Second thing, enact federal sentencing reform. If nothing else is a leadership question, come on, Congress, get caught up with the rest of the states who could do this by amendment if they wanted to. Show the leadership, because really the inversion table is pretty clear, the, inverse, the inversion is pretty clear. In the federal government's jails is mostly drug offenders. In the state's jails are mostly violent offenders. So the federal government, we think, should take a leadership role, come on board with at least 29 other states in the nation, Louisiana to be, now if you want to be embarrassed in D.C., say Louisiana's ahead of you. That's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to throw that out there. I know there's some Congress folk here, but I mean, you know, if Louisiana's in front of you, you got a problem. I love my home. Mental health and drug addiction. Very few social scientists will disagree with this. Of the 2.3 million people in America's prisons and jails, 50% of them have diagnosed mental health illness. Very few people disagree with that data point. In fact, I believe it. So since I said it, it's got to be true. Think through that for a second. Not only does that on its face tell us we have a problem that's not being addressed by doctors and nurses, but being addressed by jailers and cops. Cook County is one of the largest mental health providers in the United States of America, Cook County Jail. What it tells us, though, is back up a little bit. If you want to know what separates the police from the community of the litany of things that can, here's one that can, does, will, and will always. He calls. Would y'all come over here? And we say, sure, what you want? Well, my son's on a street corner, and he's acting up. You know your son's got a mental health problem and didn't medicate himself that day. The two enterprising cops that come flying over with lights and siren because probably you heard, what? Oh my God, I gotta hurry up, it's only 10 minutes. Because we wanna do questions and answers. So basically what's gonna happen is those cops are gonna fly up to their house, they're not gonna know all the history you know, they're gonna confront somebody who's in a mental crisis episode and the chances of that ending good are pretty low. And then what it's most likely gonna end up in America is him going to jail. How do you feel about the police when that happens? We do that all day long in America. We do that every day in America. We do it for mental health. We do it for drug addiction. The neighborhood drunk who defecates on somebody's property is a problem, and the only result we have is arrest. Of course we're making people angry. Bolster community policing. It works. Justice and legitimacy. It works. These are the kind of things that encourage people to want to be part of the solutions. They want to work with the government. We have to keep that going. We have to look at sentencing reform. A felony in 1970, which would get you a year at hard labor, is on a $500 Limit, let's say. My cell phone costs more than $500 today, so we need to think of those things. How do you fight crime? I'm a lucky guy. Been audited by auditors every time I've been chief because, well, we just got to make sure they're not lying about the numbers. Turns out we weren't. Crime went down dramatically in New Orleans, went down dramatically in Nashville, and went down in New Orleans again. It's right there. It's community policing, folks. That's what makes the difference. 
when the community recognizes that the cops have accepted that you can't be a rough and rotten cop and put anybody in jail unless somebody's willing to talk, right? You can't arrest murderers. I open this to my son, two of my son-in-laws, my only son-in-laws. Both of them are cops. One's an undercover narcotic detective. One just finished some time as a murder investigator. They can't solve a single murder unless people are willing to talk, right? We said earlier about communities. Let me tell you what I know, because I get to do that. When I was chief in New Orleans the last time, in a very short few period of weeks, we had two infants killed. One, a young girl was holding an infant, stray bullet, shot at her, kills the infant. Another one, very similar circumstance. In that same month, we probably had 25 or 15 young men killed. When we made the scene of the baby, before we left the scene, what do you think we knew? We knew the name, address, social security number, the mother, father, address, social security number who killed that baby. But we've had shootings not unlike Chicago in the middle of a party with 600 people and everybody say, I ain't seen nothing. The question isn't whether or not the police can solve this problem by themselves. The question has to be, is the community willing to say, this is enough? When a baby's hurt, they say it like that. If we could get them to do it with the older people, we'd have a lot more opportunity. Not every police department does community policing, unfortunately. In fact, probably very few actually do it. But if we took at justice and legitimacy first and foremost, then community policing follows. I explain justice and, justice and community policing to cops like this. Who are the smartest people on earth? I hope it's the medical doctor who's taking care of me. <laughs> I'm 57 now. I just went to the doctor two weeks ago. They did some stuff to me that's like prehistoric. <laughs> good thing they got really good medicines to make you sleep. Why do I turn myself over to that person to do that to me? I believe they care about me. I believe they're trained, educated. I believe they want to know what I'm going to think. And I believe that they're trying to make me better. Policing can do the exact same thing with justice and legitimacy. And when they make that lap, that leap, it doesn't erase 200 years of mistakes. But for that moment in time, it gives you an opportunity to close a gap. And that gap could be helping them. That gap could be finding the person who committed the murder. That gap could be finding the person who assaulted the child. Justice and legitimacy is ultimately the key. There's no question in my mind about it. Fighting violent crime with dignity. That's how you do it. Right? People who are the victims of violent crime, and I've seen a whole bunch of them, unfortunately, if you don't treat them with dignity and respect, we have some social science research that tells us this. If I already picked on you, I'm sorry. If he has a bad relationship with a police officer, his friendship network is three to four times more likely to perceive their next encounter with the police officer as bad. So you're building in a resistance because the first cop didn't get it right. Justice and legitimacy treats people with dignity. As you treat them with dignity, it slowly expands. It doesn't make up for what we need to do better. It does at least make it work for that moment in time. Better science. I'm going to say it again. Andrew Papakristos, Rosanna Ander, I've been working with Rosanna Ander since 2004 when I was in Nashville. Because of the change of computer technology, we're able to be smarter than we've ever been before on everything. And it's catching up with our social sciences. Our social sciences are getting smarter, giving police chiefs and mayors and congresspersons better information to make decisions. Group violence reduction, the David Kennedy model, I've used it twice. There's some issues I have with it, but on the other hand, it's a very tailored laser-like focus. Cure violence, the reason I like cure violence has nothing to do with police. I like the idea that the community engages itself in helping other people through a crisis. What about um, justice and legitimacy? These are the three research outcomes. Advances a willingness to participate in the criminal justice system, meaning be witnesses. Advances a willingness to support the decisions of law enforcement and advances the willingness to follow the law. When we build these things into the way communities think and work and believe about policing and the criminal justice system, we get good results. Hotspot policing works. In fact, newer research, Braga and Weisberg just put out some more research about hotspot policing, but tell me, let me tell you what hotspot policing does not do. If you haven't already figured out with the neighborhood what it is you're gonna apply, it's gonna fall flat on its face. But if you work with neighborhoods beforehand about what you're gonna do on the behalf of what they need, co-producing safety, co-producing priorities, it'll work. Better physical science. Someone said earlier we all have biases. Of course we do. I'm biased to six foot five ex-police chiefs who, you know, do this. But when you look at all the wrongful conviction data that's coming out in America, and we see the strategies and failures of interrogations and interviews and personal identifications being the strongest forms of evidence, DNA 
is a way to go to a family and say, I'm not arresting your kid because I don't like them. I'm not arresting your kid. Are they coming for me? <laughs> I'm not arresting your kid because we just don't like your neighborhood. I'm sorry to tell you, your kid's DNA is there. It's something that's unbiased. It helps us a little bit. Two things that we have never learned as much as we know now. Adolescent brain development and trauma-informed responses. Those two issues almost entirely encapsulate the problem with incarcerating juveniles. How many of you have ever rented a car in your life? You know that car companies won't rent it to you if you're under 25. Now, why do you think that is? That's because they know, right? There's a lot of science to tell them, oh, these kids are making good choices. So when we look at adolescent brain development, the US Supreme Court obviously got it when it talked about juveniles in 2010 and 2014, and we look at trauma-informed responses, we get to a really cool spot. I'm going to jump ahead. Attitudes of communities, we're not in good shape. This was just done recently by the Urban Institute. These are not very high signs of positive support that the police departments are just legitimate and that they don't have bias. That's not good news. Here's the good news. This is why I'm so optimistic. Perceptions of the law. 74% of the people believe law should be obeyed. 73% think it benefits everyone if the law is obeyed. These are in low-income neighborhoods that already have demonstrated a bad relationship with the police. 71% are willing to report a crime, call a crime. 68% are willing to report suspicious activity. And 60-something percent are willing to help find a suspect. To me, that's the pony in the box that explains all the poop in the box at Christmas time. Because there's people willing to work with the police. What do the police think? 8%, y'all remember this big argument about guardians and warriors? Let me, let me let the air out the room. Police are trained to be warriors when they have to to protect themselves or others. But police are trained to be guardians. And sure enough, if you ask the police what they think they are, 8,000 nationally represented sample of police officers. 8% see themselves as enforcers. That's probably where we need to spend some time. 31% see themselves as protectors first, guardians. And 63%, 62 say they're equal. So in other words, the reason adolescent brain development is so important and the reason trauma-informed response is so important is because when, you and a, when a police officer approaches a citizen, they're going to be trained to be a warrior and they're going to be trained to be a guardian. If this research is any good, and I think it is, two-thirds of the time they want to be a guardian, but they may not know how to read the cues. This person's just trying to tell me their life story. They don't want to be in a gun battle. This person's just trying to tell me their day is bad. They don't know how to speak it in a way that I'm listening. We need to train the cops to listen, and they're willing to do it. 66% like body cameras. 66% of police officers in America want body cameras. I'm all for them. I'm glad they want them. 75% of police officers believe in community policing, and 80% understand and accept justice and legitimacy. So we don't have as heavy as a lift as we thought we might have had. But there's a data point in here I left out because I just wanted to give you a drum roll and surprise you. While it's true that 90% of police officers are there about want their police department to be better, only a third of them are willing to say their supervisors are leading them well. That's a huge disconnect. Part of that disconnect has to do with civil service rules. Part of it has to do with union behavior. Part of it has to do with just the Gallup organization finding 20% of any workplace is against the workplace. So we got to think about what you're expecting your chiefs to do given that. You can't have any public discussion without kicking the media. I'm for it. The problem is this. It is not a good day in America when Gallup reported in September of 2016 that faith and confidence in the media to report the news fully accurate and fairly is the lowest it's ever been. That is not a good day for America. The First Amendment is too precious of a constitutional right to have that little confidence. What it means to police chiefs is that people are getting the information they want through their cell phones limiting out what they don't want to know. So instead of having a population that's looking at objective, carefully researched, triangulated stories, they're blowing right by it because they don't trust it. They're going to their cell phone, and they are self-selecting the information they want. I got a brother-in-law. He doesn't know anything but Fox News. He never reads what CNN says. He never reads what CBS says. He never reads what Reuters says. He, I, this is all I want to know. That's not a good day in America. It makes us less likely to be able to get these complex missions and these complex issues out. Is there a faith or confidence issue with American policing? There's a confidence issue with American institutions. And this was published by Gallup in June of 2016, and it's been going on for 30 years. 
But in the 10 years between 16 and 6, the military still is the most confidence institution in America. 73% of Americans have confidence or a great deal of confidence in the military. Look who's next. I ought to have you say it out loud. So the police are not winning the best hand they could win, but they're in the fight. They're in the fight. They have a level of confidence in the country that is not as good as we want it to be, but we're certainly not down here with, uh, well, you can just see the ones on the right <laughs> and, and look at them as you please. Where do we go from here? We have learned too much to turn the hands back. We know that adolescent brain development and trauma-informed responses, we know that social network analysis, we know we're not going to have as many police as we used to have. We know we're not going to have any prosecutors as we used to have. We've got to find a way to deal with criminal justice reform that's not just the police for the sake of the police. I just came from Tucson, Arizona. I do work to follow up on President Obama's 21st Century Policing Initiative. And I've been to 10 cities, uh, eight cities, and I've got seven more to go to. Tucson, Arizona, they believe that uh, mental health was the biggest problem they faced as a drain of resource on the community, on the families, and the police. They built a mental resource emergency center. The measurement metric that the mental health resource center uses is in relation to police is how fast can we get the police out the door? Eight minutes. So police officers in Tucson and Seattle, and it will happen in Baltimore, and it's happened in Miami, when they have an alternative to arrest for people who are mentally ill or addicted, they will take it. I don't want you to fall out your chair saying I'm an apologist for the police because I'm not. The facts are, if you give the officers alternatives to arrest for this population, they're going to take it, they're going to use it. Tucson, Arizona, a city of a half a million people's arrest for mental illness and drug out dropped through the floor. Worse than the Saints season record. I mean, they just went all the way through the floor. But if we as a country and if we as a city and a state don't give those officers those resources, what are they going to have left? arrest. And then my young daughter, who's a lawyer, who's a prosecutor for two years in Orleans Parish, one of the busiest courts in the country, she, how much of her day is consumed by looking at people who should be being treated by her sister, who's a nurse, as opposed to her as a prosecutor, right? Tell you a funny story. I found out when lawyers become the smartest people on earth. You want to know when? Second year. You know how I know? I'm a teenage parent. My mama had me when she was 16. We had our son when I was 17. I got divorced after that marriage. We're very good friends, but I got remarried. My second wife, a beautiful Cajun who I'm scared to death of, and her baby, <laughs> who's my baby, the lawyer, she was in her second year of law school. She come home one night. I kid you not, this is a true story. She come home one night. We sitting down having dinner. My wife's name is Jill. My first wife's name is Julie. My baby's name is Allie. Allie says to her mama, mama, guess what I learned in law school today? And I was still chief at the time. I wasn't thinking about it. And her mama says, oh, baby, what you learned? She said, I learned that if his divorce ain't good, Julie going to get all your money. <laughs> I had to pull that Cajun off the roof. I said, Allie, when did you learn this? I learned this today. I'm the smartest person in the world. I said, well, go back to school and get a refund, because that was the dumbest thing in the world you could have said. <laughs> so it can't just be the police. My baby's a prosecutor. How is she being trained to think, right? How is she being trained to think? That's what we got to think about. And I don't want to drop an 800-pound anger moment in the room. You know who's probably one of the least studied pieces of the criminal justice system? We get all up into police with Comstat. We get all up into police with hotspot police. And we get up all into police with de-escalation. Do we really study prosecutors and prosecutors' decision-making processes? We don't. This is not just reforming the police for the sake of reforming the police. It sounds good politically. Presidents love to quack on about it. Governors love to quack on about it. That's not what's going to fix this problem. How many of you were here in the 1960s? That's when deinstitutionalization of mental health happened, not with Republican president. I'm a Democrat, and I don't like Republicans. Not with a Republican, because I don't. It's been going on for 50 years, one party to the next to the next. And who is left at the end of the day holding that bubbling anger in the community at a failure to provide care? Who's holding that ball right now? 800,000 police officers. I used to go to sleep every night saying, oh, Lord, please. I know it's 2 o'clock. I know somebody's going to make a stupid decision. Just let me get a couple hours of sleep. 
That's what we're counting on. We know from science that rehabilitation and reentry is better. We know from science that being treated for mental illness as opposed to being jailed is better. We know from science that adolescent brain development is telling us these kids are not making choices that our socialization of crime makes them 100% responsible for. And yet, and this is where I'll get a little defensive, all we read about is reform the police, reform the police. We should. But is that going to solve the problem? Of course not. You're still going to have all these underlying issues. Can we reduce violent crime? Of course we can. I used to complain a lot about the laws. Then I come to realize those kind of come back and bite you. Good politician told me once, being bit by a political dog is one thing, but being bit by your own dog is a bad thing. <laughs> I know that Superintendent Johnson and Superintendent Hillard, and Superintendent Hillard was a mentor of mine. That's how much I respect and love that guy. I wish he'd come back and be chief anywhere. I'd move there. But this is what we know. If murder was reducing and dropping like a rock in Chicago until the end of 2015, and then it ran back up the scale, did any of the gun laws change in between there? So it's going to be something more than just the gun laws, right? So we got to make sure we continue to open this debate up. Are gun laws a problem in America? Of course they are. Are there issues that Americans can agree on? Yeah, mental health checks, Americans can agree on a lot of things, and there's some things they can't. But what we in American policing and criminal justice have to do is quit thinking that what looks like something caused it is what actually caused it, because it's easy. It's a six o'clock press release. And I used to say this stuff in the 90s. We arrested our way out of this problem today, damn it. We're doing really, really well. No, we had to learn, we gotta evolve. And that's the problem with America right now. If we take the great advances of the criminal justice system in policing over the last 30 years and reverse back to the Joe Montana offense, we are not going to have outcomes that we're going to be happy with. We're not going to have changes in relationships with police officers who are being forced. Right? So there was four wishes. I'll just give you my only three. First, do you know, you don't, I'll tell you. I'm not a lawyer. I pretend to be one at the Holiday Inn, but I'm not really one. Do you know that in all the consent decrees I'm aware of in the Obama administration and the Bush administration, not a single one of them made as a part of the consent decree the civil service and collective bargaining unit agreements change? Did you know that? Of course it is. Of course it is. So that'd be my first request. We needed civil service in New York and Chicago in the 1900s. Do we still need those same laws today? I don't think we do, because when chiefs try to make things change, and the consent decree in New Orleans itself exempts from any part of that discussion the civil service system rules, that's where police officers go fight, that's where they get their time back, that's where you end up with serious problems. Second wish, who likes to beat up on millennials in the workforce? <laughs> Come on, show me the truth, you know, they're horrible, right? <laughs> you know that's your babies. <laughs> you raised them. You can't blame anything but on yourself. But this is the, I wish I was a police chief today. I'm recovering, I admit it, I have a problem. This younger generation, when they get tuned in, they're the best we've ever seen, not only through science, but also through experience. This younger generation, when they get tuned in, is more altruistic than the generations before. And that's a big and important thing we need to think about. For the first time in American policing history, American police leadership is going to have to change the delivery of hiring, firing, training, discipline to meet the workforce as opposed to making the workforce meet the policy. And the sooner our police departments do that, the better we'll be. And science and not anecdotes. I don't want to get in a fight with anybody. I've been around a lot of politicians. Politics sounds a lot like anecdotes. What Rosanna and what Andrew do is science. We need to be letting that drive our, we need to let that drive our policy and our decision making process in the criminal justice system, not just the catchy phrase that comes over the news at six o'clock. Because in my 34 year career and had the opportunity to be a chief 13 years in three different states, almost every one of those anecdotes turned out to be wrong. We can arrest our way out of this problem. All these low level offenders, zero tolerance. Hotspot policing got better because we thought about it better. So those are really kind of the issues. I would love to answer any questions y'all have. I have a crawfish boil at 5.30 p.m. <laughs> and none of you is invited, but I was invited, so I'm gonna be there. But I would love to answer any questions for about 15, 20 minutes. Great, um, is this, this is on, I think. Um, we have a microphone now, so this is gonna make it a lot easier. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions, Dr. Surface, but since I'm holding the microphone, I get to go first. 
I understand what you're saying about the, the Joe Montana offense not working in 2017. Did that work back in the 80s, or, or was it not working, but we were fooling ourselves into thinking it did? I think we didn't have enough capacity to understand the outcomes of it, right? Because the work that Andrew does, the Pop Professor Papa Christos, that stuff has evolved so fastly in the last few years. What happened was this. In the 1990s, if you were a chief and you said, I've arrested 100 more people this year and crime went down, the immediate jump to logic was that that must have been it. We didn't know enough. And it didn't work, by the way. It, it angered people. Thank you so much for your great comments. Uh, I remember back in about 91, 92, when Chicago was exploring community policing and adopting it. Uh, Charles Ramsey was still here, he was kind of point person over that. And I remember being part of this group, uh, Community Alliance for Neighborhood Safety, and we went to Manhattan and we did ride-alongs. And they did community policing very differently. And these days we like to compare ourselves to New York and their statistics. Do you think that was a missed opportunity that CAPS, in my estimation, is not the community policing I saw happening in Manhattan in 1991, 92? I think what's important is you've raised an incredible distinction. Up until the early 1990s, we saw American policing in the dragnet model, the professionalism era. We know all the facts, ma'am, mister, you don't know anything, we'll make all the choices. In the early 90s, as every police department that tried to get more into co-producing safety, it morphed, it looked a little different in each one, but now looking back on it, that's probably the strength of it. Because what works in you know, neighborhood X is not gonna work in neighborhood B. The problem that I have and many of my colleagues have with the current musings of the federal government is that we're gonna go back to a strategy of if we think it works in neighborhood A, we're gonna make every neighborhood get it. And that's absolutely antithetical to our experience in American policing. Each neighborhood, each city, each borough is going to be different, and how you get there is what matters with the people. Thank Hi, you. Lord. Thank you. Thank you for being here and your great remarks. One question that I'd like is, if you were still a chief in the climate that we're in where there's this divisive narrative of if you're pro-reform, you're anti-police, right. and if, you're, um, if you're, you can't be pro-police and be pro-reform, what would you say to young officers to help them navigate in these very, very challenging times? That, that's a great question. I'll start by telling you, when I first became a police chief, I was 6'10", and they beat me down to about 6'5". So if I was a chief still, I'd probably be about 5'10". I found great opportunity to talk to officers about justice and legitimacy. We didn't get it the way we get it now, uh, thanks to Yale professor Tom Taylor and Tracy Mears and others. We get it and understand it. So the message that worked for me in New Orleans, a city that was clearly reeling after Katrina, right, in 2010 when we came back, and I would just go to the offices and tell them, essentially, we didn't know the term at the time, what, what do you want done to your mom and them, right? If you let yourself get distracted by all this noise of the union, if you let yourself get distracted by all this noise of politicians, if you let yourself get distracted by all these things, you're not gonna make the right choice at two o'clock in the morning when someone just needs your help. Now, did you come here to help people? You're in the right place. If you came here to be a, uh, a nary do -well politician, if you came here to be a rabble rouser, then you're never gonna get it. But what I've seen in American police officers that is an un unyielding well of support that for me, for them, is the ones that get it, God bless, we have them. The ones that don't, we either gotta train them or get rid of them. And I think you can make the differences pretty clear to them. Hey, Bishop. It's not, it's not necessarily a question, but a reminder, because you told me to remind you. <laughs> uh, please speak about the uh, qualifications of police okay. and this new trend of them having less education as opposed to more education. I've never been elected to political office, so I don't know what those pressures are. Let me say that first. I've worked for three mayors and a governor. I don't know what it's like to be a person who goes in front of a community and says, I'm going to advocate for less education for police officers, and you're going to get a better service. There's no way. The research is overwhelming. The experience is overwhelming. I'm a GED high school dropout. I had a reasonably good career. But I know, and you know, the outcomes are better when people are educated because they learn how to think, they learn how to keep their mouth shut till they hear somebody else's point of view, and when you need to hit them with a brand new policy, they're ready to accept it. 
So Philadelphia, Chuck Ramsey, I think, is one of the stalwarts, stalwarts of American policing. His replacement, who I don't know from Adam and I don't wish him any ill will, within a week said, oh, we're going to drop our college requirement because we need to recruit. That's the worst thing that can happen to an impoverished community, is have less educated people going out there to deliver this incredibly complex service. Y'all are going to love this. San Francisco announced for a new police chief last year and removed the bachelor's degree requirement. Now, who do you think was behind that? There's a guy I know that's got a guy, and I want to get him, and he don't have a degree. Oh, maybe i got to drop it. I don't know if that's what happened. Y'all are room full of lawyers. I didn't say it did. I'm just saying <laughs> the message shouldn't be that we want less educated people at the altar of recruitment. The lesson should be we should recruit better to get the better educated people so we can get a better service to the people. Okay, I'm going to uh, one more question up front here, and then I want to try to uh, see if anybody in the back wants to be included as well. I didn't hear anything. He, he we we have to, to split a question. Yeah. The, my, you Would you do that to us? Is an, an outsider looking in? Why do you think the, the shootings have gone up in Chicago, and what do we do about it? I am convinced, as a child of the Comstat era, who did it in a state police agency and two police agencies, that police can make a difference. Police do make a difference. I have learned that we shouldn't measure it the same way we used to. There's other metrics that are more important, but I do think it's hard to rationalize. Chicago appears to be an outlier, and we heard a stat earlier that a year ago there were 60,000 stops. Now let's make sure they're good stops, but there's 60, and a year later there's 10,000. Police can make a difference, and something must be going on. I'm not educated enough to know what is going on specifically here, but we don't want police officers to be windshield cops. Anybody know what a windshield cop is? They look right through the windshield. No community wants that. Remember I showed you that the communities that are distressed with police, 75% of them want help? That's been my experience. Nashville has very bad neighborhoods. New Orleans has very bad neighborhoods. Yakima has very bad neighborhoods. Seattle has very bad neighborhoods. Those communities need the police more than any other community in the city because they're not enjoying the simple social exchange of life. So even though they're mad as hell at the police, they will still call the police. If the police pick up on that, you can make magic happen. So something's going on with the number of stops, I guess. It's the only thing I can think. Anybody in the rest of the room have a question? There's a lady back there, sure. a man over there. Man over there. I got plenty of time. All right. You've given an outstanding talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, we like, you know, being a policeman, some of them got to be macho and got to be tough. They need to be both smart and tough, but sometimes they need help. They're stressed. They see stuff every day. It impacts them. Do we, it's not a bad thing for them to say, hey, I need to talk to somebody, okay? It's, 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 it's bad, okay, and so forth. Just dealing with stress. Uh, the people in the media have to talk about every day dealing with stories after stories, murders and babies getting killed and neglect. So, do we see more of that happening in terms of, so they can get the counseling? It's not a bad thing, because sometimes I'm stressed out. We do not do a good job in American policing of officer wellness. It's one of the president's, uh, President Obama's 21st century pillars. I think it's the number six. We don't do enough of that. This is a pure anecdote. All the men in my daddy's family are police officers since 1914 through me, and now my son-in-laws. I sent one girl to law school, couldn't find a lawyer. I sent another to nurse school, couldn't find a doctor. I don't know what, I don't, I don't know. They're both married cops. Boy, what was coming next was brilliant. I just lost it. Um, oh, all of them are cops. Do you know everybody on the other side is nurses? Everybody. I've been married to two, and I'm thinking my third one's going to be one, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know what I think happens? I think these satellites find themselves somehow because nurses are very open about the pain and suffering that they treat. It's a, it's a badge of courage. And cops, they internalize it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't go to the bar room and say, <laughs> that murder really bothered me. We need to find ways to let that out, especially the younger people. They're not going to tolerate us if we don't. So officer health and wellness is important for the way they deliver service as well as for their own personal. Police officer suicide is a huge problem. It's a big, big, big problem in America. A lot of police officers are killing themselves. A lot of people are killing themselves, unfortunately, but a lot of police officers are killing themselves. 
Good yes, afternoon, sir. and thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, you spoke about community and policing engagement, and you hinted at prosecutorial engagement with the communities in which they serve. Do you have any experience with these sorts of programs or any idea of what they would look like? Absolutely. Uh, Leon Canizaro, who's the district attorney in Orleans Parish, he was a district attorney. He was on the criminal bench for 17 years in New Orleans. Then he was on the Court of Appeals for four years, and he came back to be the district attorney. He's in his eighth year. Leon, originally, when he came back, created a partnership with the police department. We continued it during my time, where the prosecutors actually came on the scenes of sexual assaults. They came on the scenes of murders. And we even started trying to get them on the scenes of non-declared sexual assault, but single female burglary victims, right? Because there's a lot, two thirds of sexual assault goes unreported. And unless you're a trained prosecutor or detective, you might not pick up those cues. That partnership is good. I think it ties into vertical prosecution as well because the police are vertical anyway, right? The police, the homicide detective who handles that case is gonna be the same one all the way through. So I think the idea of having the prosecutors line up with the cops on these particular cases produces a better product. And the idea of the prosecutor being in the community is incredibly important because even the best job we do as police officers, we're only the first witness once the case is accepted, right? Once an arrest is made, the police are the weakest character in the system, rightfully so. So the prosecutors being there to explain to people, and actually the cops hearing it I thought was a good thing too, about how the law actually works after that cop arrests you. It's a whole different world at that point. And the public somehow or another, our fault through media, television, and everything, they somehow or another think that the police are actually driving this entire decision-making process all the way to conviction, and that's absolutely not the case. After arrest, first witness, that's it. Hi, thanks for coming today. Thank um, you. I have a totally different question. Um, do you have any thoughts about civilian oversight of the police, um, good, bad, and what factors might make it better? So. I think what's happened is civilian oversight as a general principle happens every day, right? We had aldermen here earlier today, right? We have an elected prosecutor, we have an elected mayor, we have an elected council. Oversight of the police in one way happens every day through that process. I do think though that as a police chief, it really didn't bother me at all, obviously, if we had a civilian oversight board because they are gonna start seeing what I gotta see. They're gonna start seeing civil service systems because an I wasn't crossed or a T wasn't dotted, reverse that, people are getting back from sanctions. So for me, I was all for it. Say, come, come on into my world. Come see what these archaic collective bargaining agreements look like on discipline, transfer, promotion, and assignment. Come see what these archaic civil service rules look like when it comes to actually producing a case to end someone's employment. And how often, and I don't wanna pick a fight with anybody who I don't know their job, but I know what my job was. How many times are some arbiters reversing a disciplinary decision because of judgment, not the merits? The Louisiana Supreme Court finally had to say to the judicial process in Louisiana, you can't substitute your judgment. If the facts are the facts, then it's the appointing authority's problem to make the decision. And of course, discrimination, all those issues. So civilian oversight boards actually, in some cases, turn out to be either the cops are never wrong because they kind of get seduced by that same mentality from the unions, or that the cops can never be right, which isn't the right answer either. But I think as people become more educated, it's going to be the it's going to be great. The facts are the facts. Okay, doctor, we're going to take two more questions, and then you have to be on an airplane to go to what? A crawfish boil. To a crawfish boil. I Not crayfish. Crawfish. Crawfish. I'm going to tell you all how to make them before I leave. I have a funny feeling that crawfish boil is not here. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So two more questions and we'll, we'll, we'll get sure. you wrapped up. I'm enjoying this. Hi. Thanks for your comments. Um, so a lot of the changes that you're advocating or saying are effective, you know, building mental health care facilities instead of more detention centers and things like that, it was all cost a lot of money. What do we do in Illinois, given that we don't have a budget? Um, I mean, do we have to wait until we have one in two years, or can we do something now? I, I am not a political scientist. I am not a politician. But I do know this, and I'm looking right in the camera. I have never seen a mayor, governor, or president not pay for what they wanted to pay for. Enough said. So I get the process that there's advocacies of every corner, but at some point, the city of Tucson said, 
we're going to make this money available. We're going to build this facility. We're going to pay for it. And now they have brilliant outcomes for police and people who really need mental health, not a jail. Hi, and thanks for coming. Um, I, my question to you is this. Is w right now we have about a third of all adults with a criminal background and about half of all American children have a parent with a criminal background, and yet there's this prohibition on hiring. How big of an effect do you think that has on this continuous cycle of criminology? I think, well, it's, it's massive because we also have some data that would suggest to us that if I'm the child of someone who's in prison, I'm five times more likely to go to, to prison myself as opposed to a cohort who doesn't. That's the first thing. I think we're going to have to build it from the bottom up, and that's why this adolescent brain development work is so powerful. The trauma-informed responses are so powerful because if police are granted, the criminal justice system is complex, but police are the first cog in the wheel. And the more they divert people out of arrest, the better the outcomes for those people are going to be. In too many cities, there are no alternatives. So we have to create those alternatives. And I, and I, I don't want you to, to, to miss this point. As you look around the country where police officers can choose between arresting people with those problems or taking them for help, they take them for help. They want to do that. Cops don't sign up to arrest the neighborhood drunk, right? They sign up to arrest the person who did the robbery, the burglary, the murder. But you would be shocked, a, a data point that I don't think anybody disagrees with, by the way, 95% of calls for service to American policing have nothing to do with crime. So we really don't have a police force in America that's actually out chasing violent criminals to the extent that you would think. 95% of it is you know, barking dogs, automobile accidents, the music's too loud, my kid won't study their book, all that kind of stuff. So we need to reorient the direction of American policing. Quick, quick uh, poster note, we asked President Obama, we asked President Bush, and we've asked President Trump, please reconvene a presidential commission on law enforcement and criminal justice in America like President Johnson did in the 1960s because of the civil rights movement because we have to realign what are these resources, what do the American people really want the police to be doing? Okay, I lied. One more question. Tony Romanucci. And maybe that could be our best takeaway here is that we start writing letters to Washington and demand some change there. Um, but my, my question, Professor Serpis, and thank you for being here, is Chicago, let's assume, has not been doing things the correct way in terms of policing for some time. As my friends here from the west side will tell you, the Austin neighborhoods, things have not been going so well there for years. Although the murder rate has gone up, the shooting rate has gone up, even though three years ago our murder rate was three or four times that of New York and three or four times that of L.A. anyway, before we saw the spike. Now we were close to coming under a consent decree to really see some substantive change. What's the danger now that we do not get under a consent decree and it's left to our own divide to police ourselves and make the reforms necessary? Can we get there now without a consent decree? I, th I think that's the question of the day. I think that New Orleans, we had one, right? They did the investigation when I got back. We negotiated the consent decree. We started it when I was there. I absolutely believe that city needs a consent decree. I also believe that if you look around the nation and you look for cities that went broke, had a lot of changeover in chief, have very strong unions and civil service rules, almost any one of them could be knocked off for a consent decree. Because the back of house offs, the back of house stuff stops when cities go broke, right? So when a city's going broke, they don't lay off cops, but they lay off support staff. They don't have a training budget. They don't have a succession plan budget. And then the policies start to fall apart. And then the preparing your policies in the global perspective of American policing fall apart. Consent decrees bring all that back to the table. Consent decrees usually tell councils, <laughs> we really don't care what you want to do. You're going to have a training budget. Right? You heard earlier today about training. I absolutely agree. But if a city can choose between a training budget and laying off a cop, more often than not, they're going to cut the training budget. So consent decrees have a very valuable purpose. The problem with consent decrees, and I think Oakland is the best example ever. Oakland's been in a consent decree for upwards of 10 to 13 years. It had 37 original items. New Orleans had a 472. So there's a question of scale. Did New Orleans really need 472? Probably not, but anyway, it is what it is. Oakland, and this was in the newspaper. I'm not making this up. 
Oakland has a consent decree that is now stuck on two paragraphs, and they're about discipline, which isn't really that hard to fix, and the monitor makes 800000 a year. Well, I, I heard enough ums to know y'all figured out what that means. So what was happening at the end of the Obama administration, not to get any of my friends in trouble, there were beginning to be some very high-level discussions about can there be a better model? Because the cost associated with monitoring a consent decree that doesn't have to do with boots on the ground, the investigators and the monitors. Judge has to have a monitor, no question about it. And I don't want to get in trouble. My daughter's a lawyer. Hopefully she'll get a job like this one day. But does the monitor have to be five attorneys that fly in once a month at 200, I mean at $550, $600 an hour? Couldn't we hire some professional academics or some professional scientists? I'm not against the legal profession. What I'm saying is, if you want to know where the money's going, there's a big piece of it going there. And that makes councils mad. That makes mayors mad because they're like, man, we want to fix the place, but look at all this money we're paying. And I don't think I have the solution, but I think a new model had to be made. There had to be a better model created. Let me tell y'all something you got to know. I'm not a Cajun. How many of y'all think New Orleanians are Cajuns? We ain't. Cajuns are those people from up in the country. Scared of them because they eat alligators, right? I mean, you look, who, who thinks about eating an alligator? But let me tell you the difference between Cajuns and New Orleanians. I got two brother-in-laws. Brother-in-laws, I said it, brother-in-laws. One's name is Bordelon, one's name is Quibido. And these are true Cajuns. Bordelon and Quibido talking about how their boys ain't that swift. <laughs> Bordelon says to Quibido, he said, man, shit, I watch this. My boy's so dumb, I'm going to give him a quarter, and he's going to go buy me a car. So he calls his boy over. Yes, sir, daddy. Takes the quarter, runs downtown. Quibido says, she, that's nothing. He said, my, my boy's so dumb, I'm going to send him home to see if I'm there. <laughs> so the boy takes off. Well, you know the two boys run into one another. The first little boy, little Bordelon boy says, man, my daddy is so dumb. He sent me to quarter. He sent me to town with this here quarter to buy a Cadillac. He didn't even tell me what color to get. <laughs> the little borderline boy says, that's nothing. My daddy said, boy, run home, see if I'm there. The damn fool was sitting by a phone. He could have called. <laughs> Those are Cajuns. That's not us. Dr. Serpos, let's give him a hand, please. <laughs>